our meeting is being recorded. So um, welcome. Please uh, go ahead and mute yourself if you haven't already. Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you have questions um, during the presentation. Also, questions can be typed into the chat box. Um, Shelby and Melissa are monitoring the chat box if I don't see something pop up. Um, and I'd welcome you to have questions uh, as we interact uh, throughout. If you'd like to have your video on, that's great. That means I can make contact with somebody and not with a little green dot on my computer, but I totally understand from a comfort standpoint, whatever you feel com comfortable in doing. Um, today, we're going to be talking about bipolar disorder management in the perinatal period. Um, and we'll jump into a case study right away. Um, and I would love to be able to have some feedback from you about your initial thoughts on this case. So again, chat um, or unmuting yourself. Um, this is a, a case that we had um, from a phone call to the Periscope Project. A young woman who is a few months postpartum, she reported herself that she had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Um, she was also utilizing marijuana several times a day and came to her uh, obstetrical provider with complaints of depressive symptoms and also quite a bit of insomnia. Um, so having three kids myself, I recognize that Sleep issues are often common in the postpartum period, um, but that red flag of uh, whether or not she's able to sleep with the baby is sleeping. She answered no, um, that she's had a really difficult time both falling asleep and staying asleep until that until baby woke her. She denied any current concerns for hypomania or mania, uh, denied any psychotic symptoms um, with the general questions um, that the obstetrical provider had uh, reported. Um, and patient had um, said that the only previous medication trials that she had uh, were those listed. So fluoxetine, paroxetine, then the faxine and duloxetine. So two SNRIs and two SSRIs. She did report, however, that all of these medications when utilized had been beneficial to her. So I'm gonna pause there. Um, can anybody give me some thoughts about um, your initial thoughts about this, this um, case? Things that you want to ask that obstetrical provider or more information that you need to be able to um, understand for the next steps and for recommendation. So if I were in a classroom, I'd be picking on somebody right now, but I don't necessarily want to do that. Anybody at all want to share anything? Is she breastfeeding? Thank you, Neely. She is uh, not breastfeeding at this point. So that's a great question. Not currently breastfeeding. Anybody else? Thoughts of harm, thoughts of self-harm or hurting others? No, um, she denied, uh, denied any passive death wish, uh, denied any suicidal uh, ideation intention or plan. Um, she's, uh, had a, did not have a formal suicide screen, um, but said that she was um, just, just describing more depressive symptoms, felt that described her mood as low, um, some anhedonia, um, some worry, feeling overwhelmed, anxious, just um, feeling more emotional and down. Um, uh, no where is the sexual. rest of her mental health team? Where is the rest of her mental health team? Well, that's a great question, and they are non-existent. Um, that rest, the rest of that mental health team is non-existent. So, um, unfortunately, is the case with a lot of our perinatal patients. Um, they may or may not have a mental health team, um, and this is a woman who had not been on any medications throughout her pregnancy, um, and had been relatively stable throughout her pregnancy, um, as far as what the obstetrician had reported and what the patient had reported. So she had had one depression screen early in her pregnancy and was negative. So she had a PHQ-9 and that was kind of below the cutoff and really hadn't had much, hadn't verbalized any concern nor had the provider um, formally screened her since early in that year. Um, so I saw support at home. These are all great questions. See, now I've got y'all rolling, that's fantastic. So a minimal support at home, um, father the baby um, is, somewhat involved, they are not together. Um, that has not changed. Um, is she using any mania history just reporting? So Dr. Lynn Dickey is winning here. Good job, Dr. Lynn Dickey. Clearly I'm teaching her well. She's one of my residents. So is she having, is she reporting a bipolar diagnosis or does she actually have a bipolar diagnosis? So that is for the win. Okay, so I think we're gonna pause there. Um, 
So that's a great question to tease out, right? So patient reported that she has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And when I asked that question on my Periscope call, it was exactly that, is who made that diagnosis? Um, what kind of mental health history has she had? What does that look like? So all of those kinds of pieces. So what I had recommended is that we do another formal screen. So let's do a depression screen. She had utilized the PHQ-9 earlier in the pregnancy. Let's get another PHQ-9 at this point. Let's get an MDQ, so a mood disorder questionnaire, readily available online um, and a screening tool for bipolar disorder. So we can actually understand this bipolar disorder history a little bit better because patients said that she had actually never been diagnosed with bipolar disorder by a mental health professional. And she called herself bipolar because of her mood lability that went up and down throughout the day, uh, much like a roller coaster. I see Julie nodding, I love it. <laughs> um, so, um, so we asked all of these history questions and trying to ascertain all of that. Um, so with all of this in place, if all of this was negative, so she had a negative MDQ, she never been had true mania, true psychosis, never been psychiatrically hospitalized, no family history of um, um, bipolar disorder. If all of that was negative, consider a cautious reinitiation of an antidepressant. Okay, so that's that's what we had done over the phone from a periscope standpoint. Is you know, maybe we kind of make sure that this is all negative. And if it's not, I think we need to get her in for a psychiatric evaluation to really understand what the underlying diagnosis is first and foremost. So this is a case of making sure we understand what the diagnosis. So let's just do a quick review of bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is a mood disorder, obviously, um, that typically consists of both depressive symptoms as well as symptoms of mania. Um, bipolar disorder uh, type one and type two to differentiate um, for bipolar disorder type one, according to DSM-5, you only need an episode of mania. You actually don't need those depressive um, episodes uh, but you do need at least one episode of true mania, okay? Most women with bipolar disorder, or I shouldn't say most, a lot of women with bipolar disorder are diagnosed prior to pregnancy. Um, they carry that diagnosis, um, but it's not uncommon given the age of when we see bipolar disorder present in younger reproductive age women, that they may have their first onset of symptoms either during pregnancy and more frequently um, immediately postpartum. So what does this look like and what, it, what, are we, what are we looking for when we talk about mania or hypomania? Um, so mania is this really expansive, elevated, or irritable mood that must last for at least one week and be present the most, most of the day, nearly every day during that period of time. And this is a really helpful question that I utilize for my patients as well as when I educate um, primary care doctors trying to tease this out is how quickly do patients talk about um, their mood lability? Is it um, that they're fluctuating and having their roller coaster mood lability minutes and hours um, versus days or weeks? Um, because the minutes and hours or even day by day is probably much more um, um, indicative of a personality disorder, poor coping, poor distress tolerance then we see with a true bipolar disorder. Okay, so that can be very helpful in teasing that piece out. The other piece with mania is that these women have very poor functioning. True, true mania uh, of most patients, I think, are going to end up either in a psychiatric hospital or in jail or in some kind of uh, in trouble because of the, the poor decision making. Um, certainly that's not always the case, but these patients are not able to function well. Versus hypomania, we're looking at elevated mood, expansive mood, irritability for at least four consecutive days, again, so a, a prolonged period of time that's less severe, um, and often women are still able to function um, during that period of time that they're experiencing these symptoms. What kind of symptoms are we talking about for mania and hypomania? Um, so during this period, we're looking for at least three or more of the following symptoms. They're listed here. Again, the difference between hypomania and mania that I primarily look for is that functionality, okay? Are they still able to function in that home or work environment? Um, so things um, as far as increased self-esteem, grandiosity, decreased need for sleep, and they don't feel like they need to sleep. So it's not that they have insomnia and want to sleep and they feel tired, it's that they are elevated and energized and they don't need to fall asleep. I can go and go and go is what they tell you. They're talking really fast, probably like I am right now. I don't think I'm hypomanic. This is how I 
um, racing thoughts, easily distracted. There are lots of doing, lots of doing is going on. So I mentioned personality disorder before when I was talking about the mood up and down um, and that roller coaster of minutes or hours. So I think it's helpful to, I'm just gonna throw this up here. Not that I'm gonna focus on personality disorders at all for this talk, but I wanna be able to differentiate between the two a little bit. Um, but personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorders, these are um, women who have this really pervasive pattern of instability of their interpersonal relationships. Um, and they oftentimes with marked instability in emotion. So that's where that roller coaster of emotion and I, you know, I'm bipolar that um, can, can be misdiagnosed. Um, but that instability is really in reaction to day-to-day -to -day events. And they'll tell you, I flip a switch, I wake up feeling great, something makes me angry and I'm depressed, suicidal and sad. So it's very quickly transitioning throughout a day. Other um, criteria that we look for for personality disorder, that impulsivity, intense anger, what we term as splitting as well. So um, people are either very good or very bad. It's very black and white thinking. Um, oftentimes women with pers uh, borderline personality disorder may engage in recurrent um, suicidal behavior or self-injury, um, cutting or mutilating themselves as well. They can, however, have these brief transient um, episodes of, of paranoia, even minor psychotic associative symptoms um, during these really intense periods where they, they have um, inability to cope. Again, um, very different picture than what we see for bipolar disorder, but there's obviously some overlap. So it's, it's helpful to kind of um, be able to differentiate the two. So what are some features of bipolar disorder in women with postpartum depression? I think this is really helpful to understand and recognize because when we have these young reproductive age women who may or may not, who may not have had an episode of any mood symptoms previously are presenting with their first mental health history with postpartum depression, and they're not getting better. Um, it makes you kind of wonder, well, what is there something else going on? So in women who have a diagnosis of postpartum depression or what look like a postpartum depression, and they're not improving or something, something seems off, these are some features that may have you pause and think about whether or not this is actually about bipolar disorder that hasn't yet presented with a hypomania or mania. Oftentimes these are younger women, they have depression immediately onset after delivery. So within those first couple of days, they really crash. So they have that hormonal component. Um, they have a higher number of episodes. They've had an episode before. There's some seasonality component, um, certainly a history, a family history of bipolar disorder. And oftentimes what I'm seeing is I'll get a referral and they've been on a couple of different antidepressants. And oftentimes what I'm hearing is that I felt great for the first few days after it, or, and then I kind of crashed again. So whether they were getting hypomanic with the initiation of an antidepressant um, or had some kind of other poor response or that they're not responding at all. Um, so those are kind of some things to be thinking about if you've got a patient with postpartum depression who isn't quite fitting your, your classic presentation and maybe not improving. Why is this why is bipolar disorder um, so important to, to recognize? So there's obviously lots of different reasons, um, but the risk of recurrence for our patients with bipolar disorder is incredibly high. This was really a landmark study done by Kim Yonkers back in the early 2000s that showed the risk of recurrence of bipolar disorder. So a relapse of either hypomania or mania or a relapse of depression um, following medication discontinuation. So with abrupt discontinuation at the time of conception, 100% of these mamas in this study relapsed at some point during their pregnancy or postpartum period, really high rates of relapse. And even with a 14 day taper or more, um, these again, two thirds of these women are relapsing. And so, um, the, the gut reaction for a lot of women to discontinue their medications or their obstetrical providers to say, yep, hold off on everything if you've been stable, it doesn't work well with these women. So that's a, something that we need to be mindful of. Um, Viagra did a similar study a, a few years later, again, looking at recurrence of bipolar disorder who continued versus discontinued. Um, so the women with the purple line up on top, they actually maintained their treatment 
and they still had a relatively high relapse rate. So if you can see that, so um, so still still a pretty high relapse rate, even if they were maintained on their medication. Um, obviously, they fared much better than those who discontinued. What are some of the risk factors for postpartum depression recurrence? Says again, the biggest one of the biggest risk factors that we have for PPD um, is actually this a diagnosis of bipolar disorder type two. So type two is a hypomania in depressive episodes. So many of our mothers don't get diagnosed with bipolar disorder type two because they may be seeking care from their primary doctor, complaining of their depression and don't necessarily disclose the episodes of hypomania, or they may not even recognize that the episodes of hypomania are problematic and they may not be being screened for it. Um, on average, there's been some studies that have shown that women with bipolar disorder type two are misdiagnosed for about seven to 10 years after their first episode because we're, we, we keep treating them with antidepressants um, because we're missing that hypomania. What are some other, what are um, risks to the pregnancy of having a diagnosis of bipolar disorder? Um, I'm gonna reiterate this a couple of times. This is not, this is independent of medication exposure. So this is not simply due to mood stabilizers or antipsychotic exposure, but these women who have bipolar disorder um, and are pregnant have higher rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes, including gestational hypertension, hemorrhage, placental previa, they have increased rates of labor, of induction of labor and cesarean section rates, and they're more likely to have babies that are quite tiny. Um, obviously, we've talked about this increased risk for psychiatric illness, including postpartum psychosis, um, huge risk um, with postpartum psychosis, as well as suicide. Most of the studies that we have with attachment in maternal fetal um, bonding or maternal infant bonding have all been um, specifically looking at depression. We haven't had those studies with bipolar disorder mamas, but it makes sense that if you have a mother who's has an untreated bipolar disorder, that those kiddos um, and that mother-infant diet is also going to have some impaired bonding as well. Again, these studies have indicated worse pregnancy outcomes really regardless of medication exposure. So we know that medication exposure is not the sole reason for some of these adverse pregnancy outcomes that I just listed before. So we really do believe that it, it's the illness itself and or probably in combination, the behaviors that are associated with having the illness, um, impulsivity, substance use, risky situations, poor prenatal care, et cetera, that have a ne negative effect on these pregnancy outcomes. I mentioned postpartum psychosis. I just want to reiterate that here. Um, postpartum psychosis is one of these really true psychiatric emergencies in my book. Um, I recognize that I'm biased and that I do what I'm doing what I do. Um, but the, the reason that I really feel strongly about this is the really high rates of suicide. So about a 5% rate of suicide in a mom who has postpartum psychosis and infanticide, about a 4% rate of infanticide for women who have postpartum psychosis. And postpartum psychosis, about 95% of these women develop symptoms and they have their diagnosis within the first four weeks after delivery. This is not a mother who's developed psychotic symptoms secondary to a depressive episode months and months later. These women decompensate very, very quickly, um, often within the first three to 14 days postpartum. And oftentimes these women can have very um, telltale prodromal signs even within the first few days. So prior to discharge from the hospital, um, they start to look a little bit hypomanic. They almost look too good for having just had a baby. Um, they, you know, they, so some of that, um, what I talked about before, the, the pressured speech, the lack of need for sleep, they just start kind of going too much. Um, they're not that exhausted postpartum mom who needs some sleep in those first couple of days. That's not what we see. Um, they decompensate very quickly in terms of disorganized behavior, psychotic symptoms, hallucinations, et cetera. And why, why I bring this up here with our bipolar disorder talk is there is an incredibly strong bi-directional link with bipolar disorder, particularly bipolar disorder type one. So that's again, high highs with true mania and, and um, major depressive episodes. So if you have a woman who has a diagnosis of bipolar disorder type one, that's a confirmed diagnosis, you best be looking for a postpartum psychosis or be monitoring in that be part of that discussion. And on the flip side, if you have a mother who has no psychiatric history or only a diagnosis of depression perhaps and ends up with postpartum psychosis, after she's treated and the dust settles, 
her mental health team had better be looking for a postpartum or for, for a bipolar disorder. So it goes both ways. Okay. Um, certainly, if you have a woman with a new onset of postpartum psychosis, no other mental health history, obviously, we, we also need to be doing a, an, an organic workup for new onset psychosis as well. So we, we don't want to miss anything from an organic etiology. Okay. So this is great and all, and all of our standard um, recommendations are for um, screening of depression, right? So we all know that we should be used screening at least once during pregnancy, utilizing a validated screening tool. Everybody knows that um, and would have some follow-up systems in place. But we're not screening for mania, um, or not consistently at least. And so hopefully I've um, convinced you enough in the last few minutes that we need to at least be doing some screening for mania as well. Um, and that can be relatively easy. Um, sometimes I just say do a one-liner question. Has there ever been a period in your life where you felt too good, too happy, over the top, invincible, where you could go and go and go for days and days on end? And my moms who are feeling really depressed are like, yeah, no, that looks, sounds great, but no, women have never, never felt like that. But if they pause or if they have to think about it or they say, well, there was this one time whip out an MDQ, print it off online, go to Google, find it, and do a formal screening for mania. Or certainly if they have a history, whether it's their own self-reported history or it's in their it's in their epic um, or EMR, um, take a peek and, and do a formal screening. We don't want to make things worse by giving a, a patient an antidepressant who has a diagnosis of bipolar. So the MDQ, again, very easy, 15 items, self-report inventory, inventory. Um, I screenshotted it here just so you can see what it looks like. Yes, no questions. In that question one, you're looking for more than seven yeses. But even if they have more than seven yeses, they also need to have a yes to question two, which is are they happening all at the same time for the same period of time? And do they impact functioning to a moderate or severe level? So again, we need all of them to, to have a positive screen. Okay, and again, this is screening. It doesn't mean that they have it, but at least it gives us a little bit more information. I'm going to pause here, grab a sip of water, and I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions before I go on to Psycho Farm. All right, here and none, and seeing none in the chat box. I'm going to keep moving and be thankful that my children have not busted in my door yet. So we'll see if we can keep them out for another 30 minutes. So let's start with lithium. Okay, lithium, old school. Old school, however, first line management remains first line management in the management of bipolar disorder and pregnancy. And the reason is, is because we have data. Um, so that's the difference with a lot of these different medications is that we have data to support use. Now, that being said, I would argue that a lot of psychiatrists are not utilizing lithium with the frequency that we did maybe 10 or 20 years, years ago. So a lot of women are not coming to us reproductive age on lithium. Oftentimes, they're coming on atypical antipsychotics. We'll get there. Um, but from a data standpoint, we have a lot of data to support use of lithium in pregnancy. The answer on the board exam question is always Epstein's anomaly, right? So we know that lithium has an increased risk of, of, of Epstein's anomaly or a right ventricular out, outflow track, tract obstruction. Um, however, in the, the, the newest best done studies, so this was a New England Journal of Medicine study back in 2017 um, that had over 600 exposures with first trimester exposure use of lithium, the, the risk was much lower than what we had first thought or had reported. So Epstein's anomaly in the general population is quite rare, about one in 20,000. Um, in looking at all cardiac defects for lithium, um, the risk was about 1.9%, okay? So I usually say 2%. And the other caveat that we have to have is that the general risk to the general population, so if a woman does everything quote unquote right and has no exposures, what is her risk of a cardiac malformation for her baby to have a cardiac malformation? And the risk for that is usually about 1%. And in this study, the New England Journal of Medicine study, they, they had it at 1.15. So what I typically say is general population has a risk of 1%. Exposure lithium has about a 2% risk. Is it statistically significant? Absolutely. But 98% of babies who are exposed to lithium will not have a cardiac defect. And I think it's really important to put that in terms of absolute risk to an individual patient versus just saying 
double the risk or, you know, a relative an odds ratio or what, it, what does all of that mean to an individual patient? So if you can get it down to that percentage of what it means to them as an individual, that's incredibly helpful. Other things that we worry about um, from a neonatal standpoint, lethargy, fatigue, floppy baby syndrome, i.e. hypotonicity, um, hypoglycemia, neonatal goiters. Um, so these are other things that have been reported with lithium utilization throughout pregnancy. Polydipsy and polyuria for, for mom um, can be exacerbated by lithium use in pregnancy. So that, that's something else that we, we um, are mindful of. The other piece is, again, 15 years of I'll date myself of how long I've been practicing. We had this thought process of we, knowing that we had to increase lithium through lithium dosing throughout pregnancy because of increasing GFRs and, um, and increasing blood volumes throughout pregnancy. So the thought was that we had to be obviously quite careful of monitoring lithium levels and likely have to do pretty careful lithium um, increases throughout pregnancy and drop that dose pretty precipitously postpartum so that women don't get lithium toxic. This was a study out of the British Journal of Psychiatry back in 2017 again, um, that monitored women um, over 100 pregnancies, uh, or over 100 pregnancies and just followed their lithium levels. And you can see that that percentage of lithium level change first through third trimester certainly does trend down, absolutely. Um, but probably not as far down as we initially thought. Um, and then it doesn't rise nearly as high as, high as what we once thought it did. So, um, this was helpful to kind of understand and, and uh, follow observationally in, in, in these women. But what does it mean for actual use from a clinical standpoint? So if I've got a woman who's on lithium and has been stable in lithium and, and wants to continue that throughout her pregnancy, we should be checking levels every three to four weeks throughout her pregnancy and probably even more frequently um, after 34 weeks. So about once weekly at, at, after 34 weeks until delivery. Her dose of lithium should be adjusted based on her preconception lithium response. So pre-pregnancy, the dose of lithium that kept her stable was a lithium level of 0.8. That's what we should try to maintain throughout her pregnancy. And if we need to make dose adjustments throughout pregnancy to maintain that level, that's what we should do. Twice daily lithium dosing can help minimize those peak lithium blood levels. Um, and we need to make sure that delivery does not um, increase lithium levels, although that study just showed you, um, demonstrated that it probably wasn't as dramatic of an increase as we once thought. So some of the, some clinical recommendations are maybe just to hold lithium for a day and then really have um, careful lithium blood monitoring um, or um, bringing that level back down or that dose back down um, to her preconception dose um, fairly quickly post delivery. Let's talk a little bit about major malformations in the antileptics. Um, so this was an international registry out of Europe for Europe um, looking at antileptic drugs. Um, so these were not necessarily utilized just for psychiatric indications, but again, we're just looking at, primarily this study was looking at major malformations. And I totally forgot to bring my, my mug, so I'll tell you about my mug in a minute and show everybody. How so what I pulled out of this study was the most commonly utilized mood stabilizers for psychiatric indications, given what we're here to talk about. Um, and I would argue of these, the most common is going to obviously be, be valproate, carbamazepine, and the motrogene is typically what we see most in use for psychiatric indications. Keeping in mind that the general population, that the risk of major malformations in the general population is between 1% and 3%, depending on how all-encompassing we are. You can see that valproic and carbamazepine are well above that um, from a major information standpoint. Um, lamotrigine falls below that 3% of a slightly, and oxcarbamazepine, although very similar structurally to carbamazepine, appears to have um, some, some kind of protection, very different um, than carbamazepine, and that's been pretty consistent across a couple of different studies. So it seems that oxcarbamazepine um, has less risk of major malformations as compared to carbon acid. So Valproate, um, Depakote, um, my fellows this last year for Christmas gave me a coffee cup and it says Depakote is the devil. 
and bless their hearts. They made it all special for me, and I love it. And I should have brought it in since it's chatty. Um, it's, and I carry that, and they hear me preach on this that just because there is this very high rate of major malformation. So 10% risk is what that last study said. The neural tube defect risk is about 2%. And then we look at all of these other potential major malformations or minor malformations, particularly cranial de um, facial defects, um, cleft lip, cleft palate, cardiac issues, hypospadias, polydactyly. Like it's a, it's a wealth of major malformations that can happen with this medication. The other piece that, that we need to keep in mind is that women with bipolar disorder that their risk of unplanned pregnancy is even higher than the general population. It's about an 80% risk of unplanned pregnancy. So these women don't always go very early um, when they find out that they're pregnant. And so this is something that I don't recommend at all um, for my reproductive age women. And period, end of story. And I'll, I'll show you some more data to support that. The other, the other piece is that there's really no safe dose of Valproate. There's dose correlation that's noted. You can see that um, with do, with uh, total daily doses over 1,450 um, milligrams a day, which isn't uncommon for management of bipolar disorder, there's a 25% risk of major malformations. Okay, so it's just very, very high. Additionally, there's neonat and neonatal toxicity as possible, and the neurocognitive development is impacted as well. So when I get these calls or a frantic email or text from a, a obstetrical provider saying, I've got a woman, she's already 10 or 12 or 14 weeks, and she's on death coat, the horse is out of the barn. Should I just keep her on it? The answer is no. Like, no, we shouldn't because of that risk of neural um, developmental disorders, including autism. So we've got good data to support not utilizing Velproid throughout pregnancy. Other countries, I think, are doing a better job of really not managing um, utilization of this medication in our reproductive aged women. I think our neurology colleagues are probably doing a, a better job of really managing, managing and, and monitoring for long term birth control of, of Alproid. Um, so I, I don't personally feel comfortable with its use unless a woman doesn't have a uterus or um, she's got an IUD in place. Um, and, and we've documented um, that this is the only medication that's. Carbamazepine also probably should be avoided in pregnancy if possible. Again, um, that initial study for Europe showed a major mouse formation risk of about 5.5% um, overall. Neural tube defects in, in another study was about 1%. Other studies have shown as high as 11% for facial defects for carbamazepine. So again, a, a host of major malformations with exposure. Again, this is also dose dependent. So higher than um, 700 milligrams a day, about double that risk. Um, so again, this is not something that we should um, be utilizing our, our reproductive age women um, if we can uh, avoid it. Um, there is a multiplicative effect when carbamazepine is utilized with uh, our anticonvulsants, particularly Depakote, um, also carries a fairly high risk of developmental delays. So again, Exposure at no point in time, I would feel comfortable um, in, in my patients in, in, with utilization. As I mentioned earlier, our oxcarbamazepine or trileptol um, seems to have something different, even though it's again derived from and structurally similar to carbamazepine. The major malformation risk appears to be much lower with oxcarbamazepine as compared to um, carbamazepine. Um, the problem with this medication in particular is that we don't have nearly as much data with longer term neurocognitive development. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if we can avoid that, that's great um, because there are other medications from a mood stabilization standpoint that we probably have a little bit more data with. Um, and that includes lamotrigine primarily. So, lamotrigine is my go to mood stabilizer um, from a safety profile in pregnancy. Um, if a woman's, you know, particularly for bipolar disorder type 2, so it, it has confers good utilization in that population. It has a much lower risk of major malformation than other anticonvulsants. Um, there is an evidence of some dose response, though. So if um, you're utilizing higher doses, um, there is a higher risk of major malformations, much like the other antileptic medications. I would argue in psychiatric practice, and typically not utilizing those doses, um, but it's not uncommon, again, for our neurology colleagues to utilize those doses for um, seizure management. 
I very clearly remember the question on my first set of boards about cleft lip and cleft palate um, with lamotrigine exposure. Um, and so that was something that we had initially had seen a bump with. However, um, it's been fairly controversial and more recent studies have not confirmed an increased risk of major malformations. Um, so um, with cleft lip and cleft palate in particular. Um, so that's something to be uh, aware of as well. There have been neurocog or cognitive, um, neurocognitive development studies and following these cells, um, post um, uterine exposure. Um, and shows normal cognitive development up until about one year of age, which again is quite reassuring. The difficulty um, from a management standpoint with lamotrigine in pregnancy is that estrogen increases the clearance um, by inducing the liver enzymes that are involved with its metabolism. So pregnancy induces the metabolism of lamotrigine, meaning that lamotrigine dose uh, levels will decline throughout pregnancy, even if the dose remains the same. Clinically, I typically am not monitoring lamotrigine levels for my psychiatric patients. So much like we talked about with lithium, you could monitor lamotrigine levels and increase the dose of lamotrigine prophylactically to keep that level steady. Most of the time with my patients with bipolar disorder, I've seen them about once a month anyhow. And so I monitor clinically and increase the dose if need be. However, if I've got a patient who, who's use a, using lamotrigine for both seizure management and mood management, that's a different story. So I don't want her, I, I don't want um, her lamotrigine level dropping uh, from a seizure standpoint. And so we'll probably work with neurology in monitoring that lamotrigine level and increasing, um, to, uh, increasing the, the, do, uh, the dose uh, at that point to keep that. Um, I see a question of impact, potential impact on baby's development. Oh, speak to a father having a bipolar disorder diagnosis and taking death apart. Okay, um, let, me, let me answer that question real quick. Um, I am not gonna be able to speak to that because I don't know the data at this point about bipolar disorder diagnosis or are you thinking from a, from a, a medication standpoint and, and having Depakote exposure from sperm? Jan, is that what you're kind of asking? So if that's the case, I don't, okay. So if that's the case, I don't know the answer to that. But there's been a, some studies looking at just the impact of, of paternal mental health on development, but I don't know the answer specifically about um, spermatogenesis and how that, how Depica would impact that offhand. My apologies. Okay. So lastly, there's, uh, there's some comments question about lithium versus lamotrigine. Um, so which one should we kind of go to? Um, there's a Danish national registry study that compared the risk of psychiatric hospitalization within three months postpartum. There were significant differences, although those are pretty, if you look at them, a 7% 7, a 7 risk of um, high hospitalization versus a 15% risk. While not statistically significant, those, those seem very different. A couple of problems with the study. Number one, I think the biggest issue is that lithium and lamotrigine are utilized for very different patients. So um, typically lithium bipolar disorder type one and lamotrigine for bipolar disorder type two. It's not always the case, um, but I, I think it's it's basically what I'm trying to show is that lamotrigine is not inferior, but I think there's more to the story than what this um, study demonstrates. I get asked a lot about folic acid supplementation. And if we just give her enough folate, can we continue on the carbamazepine or can we continue on the drug? And the answer to that is probably not. Um, there's been pretty controversial data regarding folic acid supplementation and um, whether it actually does reduce the risk of major congenital malformations when you have an exposure to an antileptic drug. Um, so what the recommendation is, is that if a woman's on antileptic medication, she should be receiving folic acid supplementation. Typically, we recommend about four milligrams per day, um, but that, that may or may not um, decrease the risk of a neural tube defect. And so we shouldn't just have women supplementing with it, thinking that that is going to be protective um, and certainly want to be protective with uh, some of the other mal malformation or the neurocognitive disorder piece that we discussed. So let's flip gears and talk a little bit about antipsychotic use in pregnancy. Um, this is 
older data at this point, although the study was published in 2017, the, the, the graph is obviously only going through 2010. But even at that point, you can see pretty rapid incre increases in those last few years, um, escalation of use of the atypical antipsychotics. Um, and I, I would anticipate that that's even gone higher um, in the last decade, particularly because um, we're utilizing these medications for more and more psychiatric indications. First generation antipsychotics, so what am I talking about? Um, Primarily, the most data has been looked at with Haloperidol or Haldol, um, but a lot of these other medications have been looked at. Um, the thing to remember about the first generation antipsychotics is that the vast majority of this data was derived from patients who were being who were given these medications to treat hyperemesis, um, and they weren't presumed to have a primary psychotic disorder. So, Presumably, they were taking these medications at lower doses and on a PRN basis and likely not throughout the duration of the pregnancy. So big caveats for the data for that piece. What we do know is that it doesn't appear to have a pattern of major malformations um, that are noted. However, it does appear to have slightly higher risks of major malformations as a class, but no pattern. So that brings into question whether or not the major malformation is secondary to the drug versus the um, underlying disorder. So that's kind of the, one of the things that we think about when we don't see a specific pattern. We do know that there are some risks to the neonate, um, so lower mean birth weight, higher incidence of small for gestational age. We don't see any demonstrated effects on behavioral, emotional, cognitive development, but we don't have any large scale prospective studies that have been completed. They've all been smaller, retrospective reviews, typically limited to one year post delivery. Atypical antipsychotics, as I mentioned in, with that first graph, really have um, exploded with utilization in the last two decades. Um, in the green box, you can see uh, kind of the most commonly utilized atypicals at this point. Those with the stars are the ones that we have the least amount of data with. So they tend, the data that we tend to have with a lot of medications in general tend to be the older medications. So with the exception of clozapine. Um, so clozapine was the first one, but we don't have a lot of data on clozapine. Um, we've got this great national pregnancy registry that's run out of Mass General. So I really, really encourage you that if you've got a woman who is choosing to stay on her atypical antipsychotic and she's pregnant, that she um, gets registered um, with this registry. Um, you can go online, Google's your friend in this case, womensmentalhealth.org. Um, and get her signed up or ask if she's been willing to do that. It's a couple of phone calls throughout pregnancy, one postpartum, um, she can um, consent to have her medical records um, forwarded or not, and they'll still include her in the registry, even if she chooses not to have her medical records. But this is the way we're going to get some additional data about these kinds of medications. Um, so this this last p uh, this this study um, that was reported a few years ago now um, was fought, prospectively following about 700 women um, looking at exposure to second generation or atypical antipsychotics versus. Um, those women with psychiatric histories without any exposure. Um, most commonly utilized are quetiapine and aripiprazole. It's definitely where we have the most data with those two medications. This study was focused on a lot of these early studies for these classes of medications are focused on major malformations in first trimester exposure. Um, so they were not finding any statistical significance between those two groups, which is, again, reassuring. Um, but it's very much focused to that first trimester exposure. So what about comparing the two, typical versus atypical antipsychotics? Um, so the study on the left was a meta-analysis and that included 13 cohort studies. What it found was that all antipsychotics were associated with an increased risk of major malformations, as well as an increased risk of cardiac defects and an increased risk of preterm delivery. All of these medications do demonstrate a lower birth weight and small for gestational age. There was not a difference in the risk of major malformations between typical or atypical antipsychotics. So the risk is elevated for across the board. There is not any specific pattern of major malformations with the exception of that blip of cardiac defects. Um, 
the, the study on the right was a database review um, that looked at prescription history. Um, and they didn't, that database did not find any differences between atypical and typical um, antipsychotics in terms of mal malformations, including cardiac malformations. So you can see where the data is evolving here, right? So we have got some difference in controversial data, no doubt. This is very similar to what we experienced about 20 years ago um, with the SSRIs and having conflicting data with the SSRIs until we got some better prospective um, cohort studies um, completed with that as well. This database specifically called out risperidone as having a highest risk of malformations as the only individual agent that's having a high risk of major malformations. So I've got a question here saying, has there been any longitudinal studies that have been done long enough prenatal exposure to mood stabilizers and antipsychotics affects the risk of developing bipolar disorder in first-degree first, first degree offspring? No. Um, so the short answer is no for that question. Um, we know that the risk is going to be conferred because of that genetic risk. So we know that bipolar disorder in and of itself has a genetic linkage, both maternal and paternal. Um, but to my knowledge, there has not been any studies looking to see if exposure to these medications confers a higher risk of development being um, a psychiatric disorder in the offspring as compared to just the genetic risk of what, what we would anticipate. Does that, I hope that answers your question. Let me know if it doesn't. Okay. Um, extrapyramidal symptoms and neonates. Um, this was something that was um, brought up by the FDA several years ago at this point, so the, uh, just a war FDA warning that includes both typical and atypical antipsychotics, and it was based on about 70 cases of neonatal um, extrapyramidal symptoms that was reported to um, the FDA um, adverse reporting system. Um, the difficulty with this is that cases were typically not monotherapy, so these babies were exposed to multiple medications, um, and symptoms included that were listed here. And I think it would be difficult to tease out from extrapyramidal symptoms versus um, some withdrawals type symptoms, particularly with the atypicals, given that they are hitting multiple neuroreceptors. What about breastfeeding? Um, somebody asked me a question the other day. Hey, do you think you could do an entire lecture just on breastfeeding? I said, no, I said, probably, but, but it, it comes down very quickly um, because the vast majority of the medications that we do have um, the data that we have does demonstrate that there is a quote unquote safe breastfeeding ratio um, of infant dose exposure to maternal dose. So, what the AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, says is that as long as the relative infant dose is less than 10%, that's deemed to be safe and compatible with breastfeeding. Um, the vast majority of psychiatric medications fall below that 10% risk. Of the medications that we've talked about today, lithium and lamotrigine are the two that exceed that threshold. Um, lithium has an RID anywhere from 25 to 50%, so quite high. Um, and a decade ago or so, when I was first practicing, really the, the standard of care was that women who were taking the lithium during pregnancy should not breastfeed because of that really high transfer rate into breast milk. Um, there's been, you know, the pendulum has swung a little bit, and the, the thought process is that a baby was exposed to lithium throughout pregnancy. We know that. The amount of exposure via breastfeeding is, is certainly less, and is there a way that we can very closely monitor that baby um, to allow for breastfeeding and, and working with um, pedi the pediatrician very closely? So that I've had a handful of patients over the course of my career that have chosen to do that. However, it does really mean very close collaboration with the pediatrician and, and very tight monitoring of baby as far as baby's lithium level. Um, their kidney function, their um, cardiac function, their um, thyroid function as well. Um, and so because of that tight monitoring, I think most women choose not to breastfeed very long term. So a few have chosen to breastfeed maybe for a few weeks um, or a month or so, but not necessarily long term. Lamotrigine, the largest study has been with 30 mother-infant pairs. And interestingly, the milk to plasma ratios were really all over the place, really, really widely ranging, as you can see there. The average calculated relative infant dose was about 10% in this study. Other studies have shown that um, it's maybe between 20 to 50, um, maybe not that high. It just has really been all over the place. Similarly to lithium, um, we don't, I think if there's been exposure to lamotrigine throughout pregnancy, 
we were thinking that it's going to be less exposure. Again, the, the video, there's highly um, variable ratios here. Um, although there's not as much monitoring we would do with a lamotrigine exposed breastfed baby as we would do for a lithium breastfed baby. Um, most of the studies that are out there in the literature, case reports, I should say, are case, case series of women ex choosing to breastfeed with um, lamotrigine on board have reported um, no issues with babies. Um, so that's reassuring, again, if a mom chooses to breastfeed. Um, what about antipsychotics? Um, so the majority of known data of that we have with antipsychotics, as I mentioned, um, demonstrate relatively low levels of antipsychotics medication and breast milk. Um, again, most of this data comes from case reports or case series, and most of the data really has been pretty specific to olanzapine. Again, particularly because olanzapine has been around the longest, we get the most data with the older, older medications, um, but those have had undetectable levels in, in infant serum. However, antipsychotics can all change because they work on dopamine. It can change um, levels of prolactin which then may impact lactation. So there's been cases of lactation uh, cessation, um, so decreasing um, or inability to breastfeed or um, de um, decreasing milk supply. However, there have also been cases of gam both gamacromastia and lactaria have, have been reported with antipsychotic use in lactating women. Um, there's very limited long-term follow-up with antipsychotic exposure with breastfeeding. Um, the data that we do have does not appear to indicate any adverse developmental um, effects. As with any medication, I would uh, obviously ask that patient, a pediatrician, or monitoring infant for changes in behavior, particularly if you're introducing a medication that baby's not been exposed to in that postpartum period, monitoring for drowsiness, sedation, changing in feeding, changing behavior, or developmental milestones. Um, and, and obviously need to be cautious about other side effects to mom that may uh, affect your ability to parent. When I think about the older antipsychotics, the biggest thing I worry about is sedation with a lot of them. And so if she's going to be too sedated to be able to breastfeed safely overnight. Um, so it's so a little bit different with the, the antipsychotics, just to keep in mind that it may impact um, breastfeeding supply in one way or another. Um, so that's um, up there as well. I would argue that the bigger thing that I spend time on, however, is not necessarily the transfer rate into breast milk and whether there, there's safety with that, because I think that there's some good evidence to, to maybe continue that mood stabilizer. But the big thing that I worry about is sleep. And we know that disrupted sleep is a major trigger for bipolar disorder. And if these women are, are taking these medications, the likelihood is that they have a bipolar disorder. And I get that that's often inevitable in that postpartum post -period, post period, right? So we know that women are going to be sleep deprived, they're going to have sleep disruption. So how can we spend time in that pregnancy really developing a solid need for sleep? And I think so many um, obstetricians or even the patients themselves are so worried about the transfer, right? They don't think about, well, if I'm exclusively breastfeeding by breast, what is that going to look like all night long? Um, and if I'm only sleeping 90 minutes or less at a time, how is that going to impact my, my psychiatric disorder? So we need to really think about that. So I, I use the term sleep shifts. So mom does a feeding at 9 p.m. She skips the next feeding. You have early introduction of a bottle, um, pumped breast milk if she wants to do exclusive breastfeeding allowing a partner or other support to do that next feeding, and then she's back on for that, the feeding after that. So she's hopefully getting at least a three or four hour stretch of time. Um, utilization of a peer and sleep aid, which she's not quote unquote on duty. So if they alternate days or nights, excuse me, um, to, to be able to get some sleep and, and think about that. Um, so I, I push a lot at that if my, my bipolar patients want to exclusively breastfeed, can we early do early introduction of a bottle so that somebody else can help share the burden of feeding um, to be able to do that? Or do we do we think about just early introduction of formula via bottle work as well so that um, other other partners um, or supports can help feed baby too? We can certainly do questions, or I've got another case study here that we can talk about too. Um, hopefully this will be pretty easy at this point based on what we chatted about. So my favorite, my favorite cases are preconception planning um, because that means they're thinking ahead. So I've got a bipolar disorder patient type two, confirmed the diagnosis, 
um, very classic. She's been doing very well for uh, the last 18 months on um, Lamotrigine at 100 milligrams, and she recently got engaged. They're thinking about um, they're getting married and want to think about having a baby. What do we do? I do hope that all of you in your heads are thinking, we keep her on the Lamotrigine. Yes, continue it. Thank you, Dr. Navarro. We continue it, absolutely. Discuss the high rate, re relapse rate of bipolar disorder and pregnancy. We talk about the risks and benefits of continuation versus the risks of the medication, postpartum concerns, sleep hygiene, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so all of that piece as well. So good. Um, one more case. This woman's five weeks pregnant. Um, she reports a diagnosis of bipolar disorder to her OBGYN. Um, she's only taking, at this point, she's um, taking 50 milligrams of quetiapine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, her outpatient psychiatrist recommended that she continue, that she discontinue it. Um, however, the patient says, well, I can't sleep without it, so I need to take something. Um, she's got no other psychiatric symptoms. Um, she does describe this history of sexual abuse. Um, she's had self injury in the past, unstable relationships, describes her mood as a roller coaster. Changes minute by minute. So, this is similar to that first case that we talked about, really looking at diagnostic clarification as needed. Um, so, I would absolutely recommend that you contact that outpatient psychiatrist directly to try to understand that diagnosis. Are we dealing with a uh, Bipolar disorder versus a personality disorder. Um, I'd be concerned about a, a borderline personality disorder given some of what she's describing at this point. Um, and we can talk about it, you know, quetiapine versus other sleep medications. And we didn't focus on that for this slide set, um, but you know, there's there's some options for nightly medications for sleep. Um, so it may be worthwhile to explore what else she's tried that may or may not have that better data. Um, so once we figure that piece out, we can kind of go to next steps with that. Good. Good. Um, there's a question about getting the PowerPoint slides. So this has been recorded. Um, and so this, uh, the slide set and the recording will actually be available on our website. Um, so we'll have, have that available as well. Just want to remind everybody about the Periscope project. Again, free resource for everybody. Um, so we provide our real time provider to provider teleconsultations. Um, vast majority of the time, I'm able to call folks back within about five minutes or so, and certainly within 30 minutes. Um, we also have a host of community resource information that's available um, for you um, to be able to support your patients. Um, we know uh, we know that there's an increase in perinatal depression and anxiety right now with with the COVID pandemic, and so. Making sure that you are asking your asking questions to your patients and providing them the support that you can. Thank you to everybody for joining us today. Again, our contact information is listed there. I'm going to be quiet, and if anybody has questions, I'd be happy to answer any of them. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely astounding.